welcome back to an episode of Spectator Mode. I'm Neil Strebeck. With me, as always, is Donald Double D Ducray. Yes, yes, I am. The excitement is palpable. I can tell. I know. Can you, can you feel it level. yet? <laughs> the Stockholm <laughs> syndrome is really starting to set in. I'm really starting to get excited for these. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, no, we're gonna. We're actually. We have a theme for today's episode. We're gonna talk a little bit. Basically, just talk about San Diego Comic Con yeah. was over this past weekend. Uh, breaking it down to. You know, a handful of trailers we want to discuss and then talk a little bit about MCU's phase five, phase six announcements. Uh, trailer line, trailer wise, we'll talk DC's big announcements, Black Adam, the new Shazam movie. And then we'll also talk about Amazon uh, Prime's Lord of the Rings series, those three trailers, and also the DD movie, which I forget the studio that's making that actually. Uh, what a great question that we'll be able to answer as soon as we get there. <laughs> I mean, it. And then, of course, the MCU uh, lineup for Phase 5 and Phase 6, which... Uh, I know it's going to Paramount. I don't know. It might be Paramount. I mean, it's not really... It's not Paramount. <laughs> oh my God. Puns on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> so which one do you want to talk about first? <laughs> uh, let's start with D&D. Screw it. We're start with D&D? Why not? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So uh, the D&D trailer has come out. It has a star-studded cast. Chris Pine, Michelle Rodriguez... Sophia Lillis. Um, visually, it looks pretty good. We've got a nice mix of classes. I just love the fact that Chris Pine's in there as a bard, right? They talk about him singing and playing an <laughs> instrument, and I think that's just hilarious and amazing all this, at once. You know what I mean? There's already been some pushback with Sophia Lillis's character because she's, you know, white skinned redhead playing a tiefling. So they're a demonic race or infernal race, rather. And so they're like, oh, they're supposed to have like non human coloration. Which is annoying because, like, when you look at the actual race stuff, it talks about how the coloration ranges from human to all these like non-human colors. So it's a, it's a spectrum, as are so it's open humans. to interpretation. Basically, sure. yeah. And people were like all up in arms about Sophia Lillis getting cast in this role as a tiefling. They're like, oh, it's not what tieflings look like, and it's a fantasy setting, guys. Like, I don't understand sort of the 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 fervor and like attachment to these like mental images people have of these things especially when they're like not canonically established as being a particular way and i think D yeah. and wizards of the coast itself has also started backpedaling from that a little bit with recent installments because they didn't like the way they described evil races and stuff like that so you know it's a whole thing but uh what is your take on the trailer did you like it are you interested would you watch it because you don't play D yeah no i'm I'm pumped for it, honestly. I think it's going to be a fun ride. I'm with you with Chris Pine as far as the bar and the kind of comedic relief with that. I thought that was hilarious. Uh, I think it's surprising because I didn't know about the the fan base uh, firing back like that. So that's news yeah. to me in that regard. And it surprised me because I figured this would basically get everybody excited because it's like, okay, Dungeons and Dragons, one, it's kind of like hip and chic now, especially with Stranger Things, kind of bring it back in the spotlight. No, it looks like a super fun film. Oh, I'm I'm excited. I'm kind of curious to see what it does for Dungeons and Dragons sales interest, but I think it'll be a fun ride. Uh, I think, you know, it could be a good standalone or a kind of extension off of it uh, as far as a trilogy and whatnot as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest concern I have going into a lot of this is is how much is this going to be a Dungeons and Dragons story or how much is, is this going to be a story that has been branded as Dungeons and Dragons? And I think some of the things that like I heard and I should really double check my sources on this, but like it was an existing story line that they have kind of like massaged to fit the Dungeon D Dragons uh, lore and everything else. So it's not like it was made whole cloth for this universe. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. You know, what I mean, like if you got a story that works and you make some changes to get it to fit, you know, that can be perfectly fine, you know. But it's one of those questions of like, is this truly a D&D &D story or is this something else entirely that they're just slapping the name on because the IP itself is becoming bigger, especially well, I mean, Stranger Things and everything else going on. How much of that do you really need, though, to make a good fantasy film and still be true to the lore? I mean, I think, I mean, we play Wonderlands. I think Wonderlands is a good job of staying true to kind of the source material, still creating its, its own vibe. And I feel like that's what this movie is intending to do. So that's why at least I'm excited about it, even as a non D&D &D player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you know, it looks like a fun, super fun ride. Like, why not? Why would I watch that? And I mean, no. Chris Pine and Wet Hot American Summer is hilarious in that kind of uh, comedic relief role. So, and I like, I, and, and on all of that, I really do agree with you. I think the concern stems in part from one, anytime you're taking like a big franchise like Dungeons and Dragons, I think there's always 
has to be some acknowledgement of the source material and like the existing fans for that. Th those are going to be the first people you pull to the theaters, the people who already have an attachment to the franchise, right? And I think number two, um, Dungeons and Dragons is a very dense lore because it really does like Marvel stuff, right? Like there's multiple planes, dimensions, you know, storylines or realms and stuff, you know, so like different settings. Uh, that they could be setting it in and using and stuff and characters and gods and everything else. Like they all have different incarnations depending on the exact setting you're using. So I don't think they're going to get into it that lore heavy, especially in a first movie like this. But all that stuff is like, what are their long term plans with it? Because there's a lot there that they can work with to develop those stories. And like there's very successful book series set in those D&D &D worlds. You know what I mean? So the characters and everything else can be made completely from scratch you have a nice universe to work in with established rules and parameters in terms of spell casting and gods and and devils and right and wrong and all that stuff so they can go hog wild with it long story short i hope they i hope that it goes amazing and i hope we get a lot more i mean moving along on trailers though we got lord of the rings yeah from amazon what are your thoughts oh man i am so apprehensive dude i'm gonna be real honest with you <laughs> I mean, because so we talked about uh, Rings of Power in a previous podcast here. And one of the things that I said that I liked about it is that they're visiting a time period that isn't like super spelled out in the books, right? Like a lot of the events in the Rings of Power, if they're discussed, are discussed in the Silmarillion, which is more of a collection of uh, short stories and almost like vignettes over the early ages of the world before we get to the events in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I was like, hey, this is great. Like you you have a lot that you can fill in here with like a nice kind of skeleton to build off of. That seemed cool, right? But they're really diving into some like big names and like right off the bat, you know, Elrond, Galadriel, Durin, who is like the the ever the forever god. Like it's it's the king author of the dwarves, right? Like they have their whole lore around the first great king of the dwarf was Durin, and he would come seven times and be reborn. You know, this is during the fourth that we're going to be seeing in uh, Rings of Power, facing off with Elrond from a clip that we saw there. They're really just going for some real huge headliners and heavy hitters. And on the one hand, like, why not? I mean, I guess I guess you have them to play with, so do it. But at the same time, like, mm -hmm. I'm concerned that they're biting off a real big chunk of that story and diving right into it before they, like, lay down the foundation of things and sort of... There's no, there's no like starting small and building big right like they're just right there from the beginning mixed feelings about that yeah i mean i think they are aware the fan base is going to kind of be already in tune to your point as well and kind of know the characters that they're messing with but uh i, I will say curious to see how amazon does with this uh they've done a good job with the boys some of the other series kind of been hit or miss so the track record there a little bit of a question mark and uh also their other fantasy series they came out with uh based on the books what was it was it Amazon? Series. Maybe it wasn't Amazon. Based on which what books? was the other fantasy series that came out this summer that was kind of like Lord of the Rings esque with uh, the orcs and shit? Oh, they did the Wheel of Time one you're talking about? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and Wheel they did announce that they picked that up for three seasons now, even yeah. before the second one so, has released. But I will say, watching the trailer, it really makes me wish that The Hobbit wasn't a trilogy and they did that into a series. You know, I think the Hobbit trilogy movie-wise left a lot to be desired. <laughs> it is what it is. So I, I would have rather have seen that played out for a, series, a season or two on a show and get this kind of world building we're going to see rather than a prequel and uh, pulling yeah. a bit from some far reaches in the Tolkien universe there. I mean, the Hobbit itself, if if each of the Lord of the Rings is so dense and each of the books only got one movie in the end, Hobbit comparatively is much shorter than any of those. I don't mm -hmm. even think it makes a strong case for being a series. I think it really should have been like a short movie, like 90 minutes to like two hour runtime tops and just one and done. Cause that's, we keep it in par with, and I know like the, the Lord of the Rings movies, but Peter Jackson stuff are like a, a separate project really. So like, maybe it's not fair to make the comparison, but those have been so well received and like have really, I think stood the test of time. People still enjoy watching those movies. There were a lot of compromises they had to make with that though, to translate the books to the big screen a lot of things got left out or edited, you know what I mean? And I think people largely have accepted those in the translation. My concern coming back to the Rings of Power stuff, one, you make a great example of the Wheel of Time series, 
fell flat, I think, with a lot of original fans. Now, for new fans, I don't know how they feel about it so much. But for original fans, I think there the changes and stuff they did condensing the storyline down in the first book to the first season like they did, and that even touching on parts of the second really didn't do it much justice. And they, like I said before, they're diving into some really big storylines really early on here. Now, we don't have tons of details about this already, so there's a lot that they can do with it. But at the same time, like, there's definitely going to be, I think, a lot of expectations around this stuff. And, like, especially when it comes to Tolkien, like, you actually have people whose careers are dedicated to Tolkien research. We're going to be looking at this and comparing to even letters and stuff that Tolkien wrote that are completely non-canonical, right? Like, I've been in debates with people who are huge Tolkien nerds, and they're talking about the letters he wrote and stuff like that. And those were just, like, his thoughts and musings as he was working on the series. If it didn't get published in the book, and this is, this is my hot take maybe for the moment, if it didn't get published in the book, then it's not in canon. You know what I mean? Like, regardless yeah. of what he said in the letters or regardless of, like, whatever kind of, like, scribblings and stuff they found in notebooks and things like that, if it didn't actually make it to the books and, and being published, it got left on the cutting room floor, and it might just be an early sketch or an early thought or an idea. You know what I mean? So I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm, I could obviously talk about this for longer. My apprehension knows no bounds. <laughs> I'm surprised by that, but moving on to some things, I think you've had apprehension for the DC universe Yeah. and the black Adam trailer and the Shazam fury yes. of the gods, the gods. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to keep this one a little bit short um, because I'm, I want your take on this because I think of the two of us, you're a bigger fan of DC than I am in general. And I think you're more connected to these characters. So number one, I think it's interesting that we're getting more Shazam without black Adam. You know what I mean? And like, and black Adam is getting his own movie. So in some ways this feels like the right approach maybe to get us like connected and involved with these characters before you bring them together. Number one, um, number two, I think my question to you, and I'm curious, do you think that they're pivoting with their movie universe to focusing around the Shazam characters and the Shazam family over the Snyderverse and stuff that they had started before? Well, let me answer you. Right, let me go through your, your first kind of question with uh, Shazam there. Because one, I'm not excited about Fury of the Gods. Uh, You're not. not. Uh, I don't. I listen, Helen Mirren. You know, still at her age, still looks good, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I cannot believe Helen Mirren as a supervillain and even as a deity. It's just not, I don't know, it's a bad look in my opinion. Like, she does look old. I don't think it works. Billy Baston is still, you know, taking or leaving kind of character as well. Uh, you have the other Shazam uh, gods and the kids. I don't need to see a sequel with that, and I don't have a compelling villain that's going to keep me interested. The first one, I think, did a good job as an origins film keeping interest, but... You now have Black Adam in there. I would have rather seen them, you know, do the Black Adam movie and come back around the second Shazam to where we see that out of the gates. But I do think Shazam, though, was part of the COVID kind of pause, push back everything else, though, too. So I do think that's why that maybe the timing's off there. With that being said, too, I don't think Billy Baston's a strong enough character to carry a universe, even though they've cut out the Snyderverse. Hmm, I do think The Rock has enough charisma and stuff there, too. But then that kind of brings into the Black Adam trailer as far as is he going to turn into a hero or is he going to be a villain? It kind of flirts with that line in the new Comic-Con trailer there. And Dr. Fate kind of poses the question, too, of like, you know, who do you want to be the savior or, uh, you know, the uh, the conqueror kind of thing there? The destroyer. I don't know if I want to see Black Adam turn good. It doesn't fit the role. And you talked about it on a couple of shows before as well. Um He's supposed to be just a harbinger of doom and destruction and just straight rage. That's what makes him such a compelling villain because he he went for absolute power. It's the same realm of Dr. Doom. Like, when it all calls, who the fuck cares? And, like, that's what makes a great villain. And uh, I think even with Billy Baston and Shazam, the idea of losing to a child is still maddening to him as well. So I think that's, you know, what makes their feud interesting. Is Baston still a kid, even though he has this enormous power? And so you know how to wield this. I've been wielding it for centuries. And again, losing to a kid is always going to thwart any sort of villains. That's maybe not a new trope, but I think for the DC universe, it's something new we've seen. All of that, though, I don't think either one is enough to carry the franchise. Even if you make The Rock good. Very interesting. Who, who is Black Adam going to fight then? Yeah, I mean, because I think, I think you're, you're getting into an important 
piece of this is like something that I think Marvel has done fairly well. For the most part, they've done a good job of adapting comic storylines to the big screen, right? Like they've definitely changed things to make things work or to keep things unexpected for fans and viewers and stuff. Does Black Adam ever become a hero in any comic storyline whatsoever? Not that, like, does not that, that ever happen? Of, no. So in so in some ways, if they were to do this, I think it would be a very huge betrayal of the character. You know what I mean? Like this, that would be like I mean, he a whole. Cloth. Was essentially a hero in his timeline, but again, like immortality, people dying sends him into rage. Family dies. That's what makes me go over the edge. Right, and then in the modern world. He's like you said, he's pure rage, right? Like it, I don't know if I would use the phrase irredeemable completely. He might flirt with the anti-hero line once or twice at best, but like I think having him come fully around of this like being the world savior, as they keep mentioning, I think is a huge undermining of the character and maybe a betrayal of the fans and stuff who I think are looking forward to Black Adam being Black Adam. Like you yourself have said many times on this show. So Yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things like for, of the two movies, I'm more excited for Black Adam, number one, over the Fury of the Gods. Number two, it just comes back to the larger issues of the DC universe and like what's going on there. How are they putting this together? You know, Ezra Miller and and their stuff going on in their life and what role Flashpoint was going to play in their larger plans, because a lot of guesses were based on like that being a, a big event for them. You know, it just leaves a lot of questions. But if we look at these as individual things, instead of looking at like a larger universe type thing, you're saying Black Adam, yes, Shazam, no? Correct. All right. That would be the most accurate way to put it. Fury of the Gods is, I can't believe Helen Mirren as a actual villain. Well, is that a casting Lucy issue Lou. for you or is that a story issue? It's a little bit of both. It's just, I think it's a weak sauce to kind of, again, bring in the gods. The Shazam kids are going to fight them, but like, it's not compelling enough. You had the kind of the origin of this film. It's kind of just lingering along them. You know what I mean? So it's like a slow crawl. It's like, yeah. But again, I think that was all put together before they had The Rock and Black Adam casted in there. So, and I do think The Rock and Black Adam's character would have fit very well into the Snyderverse, especially dip more into the Injustice storyline and again, Flashpoint Paradox to where it would make more sense him as an anti-hero if you have, you know, Superman making a turn, and then it's again tapping into Black Adam's will to just be the best. So then it's like, yes, even though he may still want to be conquering, he's now fighting the universe level threat off of his own bravado. And I think right, that fits right, better. Right. I don't see what they're going to do that now. Like he's not actually doing it for any kind of good reasons. He's doing it out of his own ego, basically. Exactly. Um, yeah. And that, and in some ways, I think that would make it better. Because we've also talked before, I think, about, like, what is the role of DC Universe? Like, who's their target audience? Because, like, Marvel, I think they've stuck very much to the PG-13 movies. They've gone, I think, for a little bit of a younger audience, a cleaner image overall and stuff like that. Nothing wrong with it, for the record. You know, it's all well and good. But at the same time, it does limit some of the storylines that you can tell and develop with that. And I think DC, a lot of it has does lend itself to grittier, darker stories and stuff like that. In some ways, maybe more real than, like, you know, these really altruistic and pure hearted heroes and stuff of the Marvel side of things. So I think it'd be nice of them to dive into that and black Adam, you know, like you're explaining there's great ways that they can use that character to go in that direction. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they develop these things further. I would be surprised if the black Adam movie didn't get a sequel because I'm going to be very surprised if it doesn't do well in box office. So just off of those numbers, I'm expecting just off the rock and, the character I'm expecting it to do well in the box office, which I'm expecting to lead to a sequel. So I'm sure we'll see more of the character in the future. It's a question of how they're going to use it, where they're going to go. You know, hopefully stays a bit of an asshole. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. I feel like I'm getting the parting word on a lot of this. So why don't I kick the, off the next one though? And uh, you can, you can close this out on this. So Marvel released their announcements for phase five and the very early bits of phase six. Um, they're definitely going full in on the multiverse stuff. We've got a lot of series coming in. I think quantum mania is looking real good secret invasion. I'm sure is going to have a lot of people hype because that was a major, major series. They are making a new blade movie, which stood out to me because I think the first blade movie with Wesley Snipes was actually very solid. The second two, not as much, but the first blade movie was good. good, Yeah. So 
you know, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that, especially when I think the first Blade movie was an R movie, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So I'm going to be curious what they do with this, if they're going to bring it back to the PG-13 where they've been living with all their movies, or if they're going to revisit the R world again, I don't know. And I think the most exciting thing is the early parts of Phase 6 where the Fantastic Four movie debuts, followed by King Dynasty and Secret Wars. So what are your thoughts? I haven't been too thrilled with Phase 4 so far, I'll be honest with you. I was actually having a conversation with my brother uh, on the phone before we recorded the podcast about this. Um, I think there's been a lot of missed opportunities to lay some groundwork with Kang and Multiverse of Madness as much as, you know, we talked about it and I liked that movie a lot. I think you could have at least plopped in maybe some statues or, you know, name drop to kind of hint at his existence in other universes, other timelines. Because yes, it's, even though it's different multiverses, we already have the fractions of time and Loki. So, it, you know, there's loose connections already there. Just saw Love, Thor, Love and Thunder. Disappointed there too. It was kind of just didn't land anything at all uh, for me. It didn't really seem like it knew what it wanted to be. There was potential there, but just didn't stick the landing in any real part, joke-wise yeah. or story-wise, uh, even action scenes in some capacities. So that was just disappointing. Again, I thought you could have at least dropped some hints there with the gods and the idea of Kang or even Modoc or, you know, again, even Adam Warlock, some sort of extraventral kind of being in that. So I think there's a lot of groundwork going into phase five that still needs to happen to build the big bad. And I think my biggest worry with phase five is what there's two movies three you just have ant-man uh in the wildest quantum mania you have blade and then you have uh black panther we're kind of forever i'm sorry no it's, oh, we're kind of forever in phase four uh we're kind of forever is in counted. phase four yeah there's a guardians okay, volume so still, three that's only two movies then in phase five the rest guardians of volume three is in there shows. the third guardians movie okay you're right but still and... that's only three movies it's all disney plus shows though pretty much I, uh, I wait, wait, wait. So, Quantum Mania number one. I think it's the next movie. release is Guardians. The next mm-hmm. movie is the Marvels. That's gonna be a TV show, I thought. No, Marvels. I think is gonna be a movie release. But I'm not watching that shit. <laughs> Blade <laughs> is a movie. Captain America: New World Order. I think is gonna be a movie, and then Thunderbolts. And I am really unclear on what Thunderbolts is personally. Like that name doesn't mean anything to me right now. I should really dig more into that but series okay, wise I stand correct. I thought there was more I thought it was predominantly series I, mean, I think they're still doing like five we... movies through phase five five or six something like that I okay, think see, I thought most of them were going to be uh, movies I should have did more background on them and Ironheart though I actually am pumped for as a series that I actually will say I am stoked to really? see where they go with that uh, I think they could do a lot with Riri Williams and again just how they're going with it and kind of the handoffs with the, I think my biggest beat with Phase Four so far is some of the handoffs haven't been too clean and not building to a big baddie. It's kind of like, where's the trade-offs? Like, who's pick up the mantles for these characters? Then, Miss Marvel to me again, like having to rearrange her entire power scheme just tells me again she's a weak ass character. Probably shouldn't have her own show. Same thing with Echo, not strong enough to carry her own show. And if you're bringing Spider-Man and Daredevil into her own TV show, it's proving my point. Bring Daredevil and Spider-Man in their shows. Echo can take. be a recurring character, and she's much stronger because she still has a very big presence. But you, you're trying to basically force a character that doesn't really stand their own, isn't compelling enough on their own. And representation is still going to be there if she's in all of these shows where you have the ground level heroes mm-hmm. and she's always there. It's kind of like Punisher's role in the old Spider-Man cartoon. It always pop in. You know, he was going to come in. Shit was going to go down. You know yeah. Steal a couple episodes as well, just by the presence alone. And that's what you want with a character like Echo. That's how you get the fan base growing. Otherwise, you have a failed show that, and now I'm going to say Echo is going to fail and fall flat in his face, straight up. Wow. And then that kills the character. Already calling that, huh? Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, there, it's going to be Daredevil. It's going to be a Daredevil driven show. And that may have it succeed, but then people aren't going to ignore the fact that Echo didn't carry the show, which again comes back to my original point. Yeah, and then Daredevil is getting his own series, right? So you're going to have an Echo in 2023. Daredevil Born Again comes out in 2024. So, you know what I mean? Like, it, it feels a little bit like they're maybe doing a backdoor uh, intro or whatever to the Daredevil series and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I think you make a really good point, first of all, in Phase 4. And I'd be very curious, like, what our viewers think about it. Because I don't feel that it's had much direction. I don't feel like it's been building towards a large narrative because even phase one of MCU where we were getting the origin stories and stuff like that, like 
those still had tie-ins with like the infinity stones being present or something like we might not have realized in the moment but then once you put it all together it ends up fitting together rather nicely for the most part and like and that's sorry i cut you off there no, go ahead. um and then that's what worries me with so much of the disney plus shows coming in and then even like echo and you know miss marvel show like you don't have big characters but then you're you want them to basically doing a lot of the heavy lifting for some of the loose connections here. And I think that's a lot of, it's a lot of work on the viewer to go through and sit through some of this stuff. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I think Echo's a failed opportunity then if you're going to create a ground level hero universe in New York city, which is awesome and bring back in the defenders and all that as well. You do need the heavier hitters then, especially as things are disorganized right now. Uh, I think Ironheart is unique in that sense because there is a lot of love then for Tony Stark. We haven't seen anybody pick up the mantle there. There hasn't been a failed opportunity yet. Like we've seen kind of in phase four and like I bring up Thor Love and Thunder again of like, who's going to pick up these kind of mantles. There's a lot you can go with that and really introduce a new character and still great representation as well. Yeah. All in the right way. And you could also still maybe have a tie into it's uh, what kind of forever with Black Panther, depending on, you know, how that evolves or cutscenes at the end there as well. well. But even with kind of forever, I'm not excited for that too much because no. there's a lot of pressure on that movie now. And if like, no, no. they're going to destroy Wakanda, that leaves a lot of question marks of like, how are you going to weave in a Dr. Doom or a big baddie? And I don't think the guy they picked for Namor, I hate to bash casting, but he doesn't really look the part in the swagger. So that Interesting. has I mean, I think uh, part of the issue with Wakanda Forever is uh, Letitia White, right? Right, White, um, the actress herself who plays uh, Suri. She's had some, let's just say, like not so great takes on a few things, and and she's been a little bit problematic, and definitely not going the route of Ezra Miller. I think that's like an unfair comparison because that's to an extreme. But at the same time, I think that does point out the issues of having a problematic actor in your main role. Don't know what's going on with Letitia, but like there's some concerns there, but long story short, I agree with you fully on the phase four, not building towards anything, not being clean handoffs on some of these like transitions of power and like who's doing what kind of deal. And I think it's also a missed opportunity for them that they're not really bringing in, I think new characters, right? Like, there's very much this like, oh, we had Captain America. Now we have Falcon, who is the new Captain America. We had Black Panther. Now we're going to get the new Black Panther. And it's like, I know comics do that stuff all the time and everything else. But like from a mu movie perspective and like as a fan, I just don't want them to be derivative of themselves almost like, right? Like we've got one incarnation of the Avengers. It was great. It was amazing. Right. Really enjoyed it. Let's do something different. Let's have a different lineup. Let's have different characters and everything else going into the next uh major bad you know everything else and like let it let it be different instead of just like the inheritors of the previous avengers so i don't know i mean i feel like phase five looks like it has more direction like when you look at the titles and stuff it, they seem more related especially knowing that we're building towards secret wars and multiverse stuff with kang yeah. and so like you can see that more but it comes back to the other issue you're talking about is like, wow, how much do you need to keep up with all these freaking series? How much are these relevant? And I've been making this point for a while now of how much do we need to keep up with all of this? Because Secret Invasion is a series. You can't tell me that's not relevant for the Secret Wars movie. Loki season two is a series. You cannot tell me that's not going to be relevant for Kang where we first met the character. Oh, tremendously. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like you're getting into these things like Agatha might be like a throwaway I show a i think that's just kind of a fun it's like the i am group thing it's like okay cool that's kind right of fan service but a little bit of a throwaway that something would be annoyed because it's like why but it's why just then? it's so much stuff man it's so much stuff and like you you run the risk of one of two things right either i think you run the risk of exhausting your fans and audience by having too much going on in too many places to keep up with it or to your point things not being impactful because they don't tie into the main storyline or plot line. They're just these kind of like random offshoot things that are getting propped up by random characters. It's a lot going on. And Secret Invasion, I think, too, has a lot of question marks. And uh, I didn't want to try back to just my disrespect on Namor. Like, my beef with Namor is like... <laughs> you, you don't he, like him as a character, do you? 
I don't really care for him, but okay, let's just get that out. Neymar there case has bravado. Anyone has also doubt? <laughs> too, like Fantastic Four is supposed to start Phase Six as well. So listen, I won't be mad if there's like a little picture. He's got you know uh, <laughs> a couple of loots from Susan Storm ready, like post up in his room. I won't be mad for that. It goes with the character. Oh, your favorite, as well. your favorite. You know? uh, <laughs> just saying, Reed Richards Marvel is the biggest shot in the Marvel universe. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh man but no namor has a tremendous swagger and unlike aquaman he fucking hates land dwellers namor started off as a villain marvel's original two villains were the human torch and namor and namor stayed a villain for a very long time and he still kind of dipped in the anti-hero realm because again he didn't put on for anybody it was like hey king of atlantis i don't give a fuck you need my help you know bend the knee that always his mentality so again, like you need that bravado over the top and you need a little bit of the rage as well. Cause at any given point, he knows he can just end you. And I, I don't see that in the trailer. I don't think the actor necessarily looks that part either. Like he just doesn't have the, the swagger. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Right. Like, not that I don't think Ryan Gosling would be in a good fit for this role, but like Gosling and even the rock, like they're both actors to it. Like, there's a certain charisma and swagger they bring to the screen. I don't yeah. know if this guy has that. Again, I could be proven very wrong but I want to see that from Namor then. I mean, Even especially too, if it's going to be a bit of the fall of Wakanda and that bit of the rage, but at least I'll give it the nod that like, I like Namor and specifically Atlantis and in a black Panther Wakanda movie. Right. Because in, in some ways I think they're meant to be foils for each other. You know what I mean? Like Wakanda and Atlantis both for the longest time had isolationist policies. They're both significantly more advanced than the general, you know, populace of the rest of the world in most countries and stuff like that. Wakanda obviously made the move in the movies then to be more open and more sharing of technology and information with people while Atlantis maintains their secrecy, maintains their separation from everybody. So in that sense, I think it is a good storyline to explore and kind of like, did Wakanda do the right thing, essentially sharing their technology and everything else with everybody? Or did they make a mistake in doing that? Have they you know compromise themselves in some fundamental way because you know they had a literal war fought in their country because of black panther and everything else and like and because of uh that's where they're trying to hide the infinity stones so they definitely painted a big target on themselves and i think mm -hmm. they can explore a lot of that like stuff comparing with atlantis but again it comes back to then i think the two actors like is it is little sister going to be the right person to make that comparison is the actor for Namor and how Namor is written going to make that comparison like are we going to get them playing off of each other as foils is these both kind of like young up and comers royalty for their tribes and stuff like that and like their different approaches or it could very easily fall flat and then all this potential is wasted so i don't know i'm i'm i have a lot of apprehension about everything apparently i'm just an apprehensive no, dude no it's but. it's a lot i think for you know, what kind of forever to what kind of forever is going to do a lot of heavy lifting? I feel like I think it's a, a tough thing. Because, I feel like it has to, right? Because phase four itself did not do yeah. much. So this well, has it, to bring a lot of shit together to get us into five with yeah. some and sense of direction. Too, just because unfortunately, Chadwick Boseman uh, passing away. And also, too, it was cool that he got uh, a post humorous uh, Emmy then as well with uh, what if that was cool. But uh, with, with Boseman passing away, it, it leaves it then to where, yeah, Wakanda's universe kind of has to. Be destroyed we're gonna have to see some shades of that to progress the storyline as well which is tough and i think again that's a lot of pressure for a movie that kind of has to then end its run with two not three or four like some of the other characters and movies have gotten so again that's like if you're going to introduce name more than his potential anti-hero or connecting dots like he needs to have the bravado like jonathan majors what he did with kang like kang's a shitty villain in my opinion comic book wise yeah he's just kind of lame but what he did in loki fucking absolutely loved it. he yeah. brought that swag he brought that just energy if this guy can do that with namor because I, I basically major swag with kang is how namor should be just a bit more in your face and kind of like yeah like piss off if you're talking to me like you're a heathen you know what i mean like i'm a god you're not like he's just very over the top like that so you need that kind of energy with it but the phase six movies though i like the fantasy four starting out Excited about Secret Wars 100%. Want to see where the Kang thing is go as well. It's just the journey of how we're going to get there seems very, very muddy. Yeah. So I think I'll let you have the last word on this one. That's our take on San Diego Comic-Con. This episode did run a little bit long, obviously. A lot to go through with so much stuff that we didn't get to talk about. So if you feel like we missed any big things that you were excited for or that you really wanted to see, 
please leave a comment and you know we're happy to address that discuss it with you in the comment section curious what people are looking for curious about your takes curious about what you think is going to work and not work the future of the dc universe which has been an ongoing theme on this show a little bit where is that going what's up with that at least will we enjoy black adam and shazam hopefully and uh what we might see in the long run from rings of power and dungeons and dragons Rings of Power feels like it's diving into a deep franchise. Dungeons and Dragons, I feel like, has a lot of potential. So both of those could become their own thing. And I think, frankly, Marvel has set kind of the standard of movie universes as being a thing that studios want to pursue. So I think it's fair to look at things in that light of what comes next. And on that note, I think that'll bring it to a close for this week's episode of Spectator Mode.